From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman. Hi, Earl. How are things down in sunny Florida? How soon can you come down here, Johnny? You got troubles? Yes, over a $2,000 insurance claim. Oh, now wait, Earl. How can you justify my fee and expense account on a claim as small as that? Johnny. Yeah? The responsibilities of an insurance company sometimes involve far more than just collecting premiums and paying off on claims. Well, sure. Keeping your clients happy, a little good old public service now That's right. Even a little attention to our national security. Sure. But on such a small policy, I still don't see how you can justify national security. Yes, Johnny. I'll grab the first plane. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Wayward Moth matter. Expense account item 19620, plane fare and incidentals, Hartford, Connecticut to Sarasota, Florida. There I was met at the airport by my old friend and fishing pal, Earl Poorman, and we drove on into town. You, uh, like my new car, Johnny? When aren't you driving a new car? Well, now let's get down to Electric cases. Electric windows, power seat, air conditioning. Yeah, sure. Look, you said something about national security in connection with this insurance claim. Yes, Johnny, I did. Well, I'll explain yourself. Well, that's the trouble. I can't. You mean to say you had me fly all the way down now, here? Now, wait, Johnny. Or, or was it just some trick to inveigle me into fishing, huh? Is that it? A crack at some of the great Florida fishing you've been promising me all these years? Well, who knows? Maybe while you're here, we will be able to get in some fishing, too. Too? In addition to what? Sure, Johnny. I just had my boat repainted, the engine overhauled. We'll go out in the Gulf for kings and bluefish. And in the bay in the bayou back of the house, I promise you redfish and sea trout until you get tired reeling. All right. All right. Just tell me why you've had me come all the way down here to investigate a lousy $2,000 claim. I told you, I don't really know. (sighs) All right, Earl. National security is involved. Yes. Well? Okay, Johnny. I issued a policy covering the chemical plant of Dr. John C. Allworth. What kind of chemicals? Well, you see, I don't know. Huh? I issued the policy at the specific request of Todd Swamp. Who's he? Chamber of Commerce. Knows more about this whole area and its people than anyone else. Well, surely you've seen this chemical lab. No, I haven't. You what? As a matter of fact, its exact location is a complete secret. Oh, now, now look, Earl. If, you, if you've issued a policy, if you're ready to pay off a claim... But if you haven't seen... Look, how do you know a couple of thousand dollars worth of damage occurred? I've taken Todd Swam's word for it. I trust him implicitly. Well, this is the doggone... This... Earl, how can I possibly investigate something if I can't even... If nobody knows what... Ah, I give up. I'm sure that Todd will tell you everything. I'll take you in, introduce you to him, then I'll leave you with it. Leave me? That's the way he says it has to be. Here, take the keys to my car. You'll probably need them. But how will you get them? And... If you need anything or if I can be of help, you know where to call me, at the office or at the house out on St. Armand's Key. Come on, let's go in. Todd Swam is a young, pleasant, aggressive sort of chap. Serious, alert, perceptive. He thanked Earl for bringing me, then led me alone into his private office. Sit down, Johnny, and I'll get right to the point. Ah, thanks. I know all about you, at least all I need to know. Not only from Earl Poorman, but from a lot of the cases you've handled. Well, then you one up on me. I also know that on occasion you've handled security matters, worked hand in glove with the FBI and so on. So? All right. My job here is not only to promote Sarasota, tell the world what a nice place it is to live, nice people, good homes, ideal climate. Great fishing. Yes, fishing, boating, just about everything. Okay, okay, I'm sold. But what about this Dr. John Allworth? My job is also to be of whatever service I can to the people of the city. All right. Dr. Allworth has lived here for years. Chemist, retired. Until recently, that is. Well, go on. 
Now, in his small laboratory, carefully hidden in the swamps of the Everglades, for security reasons, Dr. Ulworth is producing an important rocket fuel ingredient. Oh? For use at one of the testing centers here in Florida. Cape Canaveral? Uh, he and his assistant work entirely alone, for obvious reasons. Look, Earl says there's been some damage at his place. That's why I asked him to have you come down But only here. a couple of thousand dollars worth. That is beside the point, Johnny. I think it's a case of sabotage. But if nobody's even permitted to know where the place is... And if you're ready, we'll go out there right away. Okay? Right. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the wayward moth matter. Todd Swam, manager of the Sarasota Chamber of Commerce, suggested we use two cars. So I got behind the wheel of the one Earl Foreman had left for me and followed him. We drove south on Highway 41 through Fort Myers, then swung left on Route 82 into the Everglades. And finally into the big cypress swamp country. A few miles further south, I'm not permitted to say how many, we left the main road for a pair of wagon tracks leading into the swampy jungle. We stopped in a little clearing. From a small shack on the edge of a bio, a tall, husky Indian emerged. He lowered his high-powered rifle as he recognized Todd's swamp and walked over to where we'd parked. You bring a man, Mr. Todd. Ben Osceola, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Ben. How do you do, Mr. Johnny? Ben, he's to be let through here anytime he wants. Very well, Mr. Todd. Have you the airboat ready for us? Already, back of my house. Good. Come on, Johnny. The airboat parked on the edge of a bayou back of Ben Osceola's shack was an aluminum hull about 12 foot long, square across the bow instead of pointed. Two high seats were built up on it. At the back was a powerful motor with a propeller of the airplane type. Todd Swam and I climbed onto the precarious little seats, and we took off. And brother, I mean, took off. What a ride. The airboat half plane, half skipped over the shallow water of the bayou. Perched up over the hull itself, I kept waiting for us to flip. After a quarter mile or so, we came on a vast plain of soggy, grassy marshland, splotched here and there with patches of clear water. Now and then, on half-submerged logs, big turtles quickly drew in their heads as we approached. More than once, a huge alligator gave us the beady eye, then quietly sank below the surface of a shallow pool. Plenty of rattlers and cottonmouths around here, too. Thanks a lot. Finally, we pulled up to an acre or so of brush and trees that looked almost like an island in the middle of the swamp. On it sat a long, low building made of concrete block. This is the place, Johnny. Unless you'd like to ride around a bit more. No, thanks. Todd Swam got the introductions over in a hurry. Dr. Allworth, a short, wiry old man with sharp features and a shock of white hair, led us into the laboratory building. No, no, Mr. Dollar, not in there. Oh. No one is permitted in the laboratory except myself and my assistant. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. You lead the way. About your assistant, Dr. Allworth. It was in the vault that the accident occurred. It was an accident. Ah, of course it was. Who would possibly want to... Plenty of people, Doctor, and you know it. it may sound corny, but this whole country has enough enemy agents. Uh, you speak as though we were at war, Todd. Well, we're certainly in a cold war. And speaking of agents... Uh, a moment, please, gentlemen, while I work the combination of this lock. This vault looks big enough for a bank. In it, I keep two things, Mr. Dollar. The finished rocket fuel component... Yeah? ...and the delicate apparatus with which I complete the final secret stage of its production. Apparatus no one but myself has ever seen. And you're letting us see it? Well, the... Accident has rendered it completely unrecognizable. I still haven't learned what happened here, you know. Matter of fact, I haven't either, Johnny. But I certainly have my suspicions. Doctor. Uh, there we are. No, 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 no. Don't go in. Well, I... Uh... The substance on the floor is so corrosive that... Well, look. You can see how the legs of that heavy metal table have completely corroded. 
left nothing but a pile of splintered metal and rust. The rocket fuel did that? Now, there, in the corner at your left, are the rotting, tangled remains of the apparatus I mentioned. The apparatus, the insurance money will replace so I can make up for valuable time lost. Doctor, I tell you, it was no accident. What happened, Mr. Dollar, is that the heavy glass flagon containing the finished rocket fuel additive... Glass, Doctor? A very special glass over an inch thick. The flagon containing about five liters of it was on that marble slab there in the middle of the floor, ready to be crated and shipped to... uh, Ship to its destination. I see. I had completed processing it night before last. Early yesterday morning, for some reason I have not been able to determine, the flagon exploded. Well, I'll bet I can find a reason. Where is that assistant of yours? Leon? Yes, Leon Salkoff. Salkoff? Yes, Johnny. A man doing secret work for the rocket missile project hires an assistant with a name like that. No, Tom. Leon Salkoff? Hey, doctor, there was a famous... Well, I should say infamous character by the name of Salkoff during the last war, a young chemist. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Mixed up in a couple of industrial bomb plots. And if this is the same man... It is the same man. Well, in good heavens... Exactly what, what I think. No, 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 no. You're both wrong. This man was cleared in the war trials. Well, what difference does that make? I say a leopard can't change his spots. But, but don't you see that not even he knows the combination to this vault... Some other way to get in? Those little windows up there? (laughs) Eight inches square and two inches thick. And you're sure there's nothing in your process that would cause the bottle to explode? Oh, I have checked and rechecked it. Where was Leon Salkoff when it happened, and where is he now? Well, he he, he went to Fort Myers for supplies early this morning. He should be back. My guess is that he kept right on going. Yeah, Todd, I'm inclined to agree with you. Because, Doctor, if what you've told us is true... Well, somehow, someone must have got to this stuff. How high are those little windows above the ground outside? Oh, about five feet. Then a gun, perhaps, aimed in through a window. But they are all in place and unbroken. Well, any reason why one of them couldn't be removed from the outside, then replaced? Well, I... I don't know. I'm going to see. I'll be right back. Don't move! What? Do not move, mister! Or I will shoot you right through the heart. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the wayward moth matter. Above your head, mister. Now, wait. One move and I will pull this trigger. Who are you? I will ask the questions. What are you doing here? Where is Dr. Elworth? Answer me. Or so help me, I will shoot you down. Mr. Dollar! Mr. Dollar, did you find anything? Doctor! Stay there, Doctor. There's a man out here with a gun. What's that? No, no, don't come out here. Leon, Leon, no. No, that's Mr. Dollar. What? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator, to arrange the payment of our claim. You're sure, Doctor? Of course I'm sure. Well, I recognized Mr. Swan's car at this shack of the Indian. But when I saw the other car, well, well I was worried about you. Oh, no, 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 no. It's all right. He's here to help us. Salco. So you finally decided to come back. Mr. Swan. What took you so long, Leon? All the way into Fort Myers this morning, I puzzled over how the flagon could possibly have exploded in the vault. You found the answer? Or have you known it all along, Salkoff? I do not understand, Mr. Dollar. I think I do, Johnny. I thought so from the first. I've heard about you, Salkoff, about some of your activities during the last war. I pray that heaven will forgive me for what I have forced to do in that conflict, Mr. Dollar. Forced? It is my hope that by serving this wonderful country that, that has given me refuge, in some way I can make up for the terrible things I was compelled to do. For the men who sought to rule the world. Now, that's a very pretty speech. Oh, it's true, Mr. Dollar. You've only to consult the records of the war trials. I may take a look at those records before I'm through with this case. I humbly beg you to do so. You still haven't told us where you've been all day, Leon. I tried to figure out how the explosion could 
possibly have occurred. So I telephoned one of our contacts. Contacts? The glass company that has furnished us with the heavy flagons. But there is no way the additive could have caused them to disintegrate. Disintegrate? No, no, doctor. Where the flagon had stood, we found a pile of granulated glass. The flagon had completely crystallized. Oh, but even so, I... Wait. Of course. Of course. By some means, a critical... Exactly. A critical... The formula for the glass that I obtained from the glassworks indicated the possibility. Would you gentlemen mind telling us what this is all about? Uh, Mr. Dollar, I believe Leon has found the answer. Well, if he has, I'll take back a lot of the things I've said and thought about him. Of course, we can't be sure until we prove that it means waiting until morning. Oh, great. Meantime, we have a lot of work to do. We spent most of the night working like dogs, swabbing out the vault with a powerful neutralizing solution. Then, early in the morning, the four of us gathered in the vault. A flagon like the first one was placed on the marble slab in the middle of the floor. We sat around and waited a long time. Then I noticed something. The rays of the sun coming through one of the tiny, thick windows. The light was focused as though through a magnifying glass. Slowly, the powerful searing pinpoint of light worked its way over to the flagon. Dr. Alworth rose and held a piece of paper where the rays converged. It burst into flame. There! Now you can see the tremendous heat generated at this point. Yes. And on the flagon itself... Exactly. The tempered thick glass wall of the bottle, uh, tempered perhaps to a highly critical degree... But to crystallize, Doctor, the way the other one did? Leon, I still don't believe it. Well, many things will cause glass to crystallize. Vibrations of many kinds. You've heard, I'm sure, of the tenor who shatters the goblet by the power, the vibrations of his voice. But light vibrations? Oh, Doctor. Of course, it... Should have occurred by now. If it's going to at all. Oh, the temperature of that bottle must be terrific. The pressure building up in the glass itself. I don't understand. Still, the angle of the sun is slightly different each day. Or an imperceptible flaw in the one that exploded. Oh, sure. Well, perhaps the other had some outside stimulus uh, to act as a, as a trigger. A sudden draft, perhaps. Oh, any little thing. Excuses, Leon, you're stalling. You said the other bottle was in here alone. The door's closed, only it wasn't because you exploded that thing. I don't know how, but you did it. And if that isn't sabotage... Ah, come on, Johnny, this gag has been carried far enough. Look! Look! I saw it, too. A tiny moth, attracted by the blazing spot of light on the side of the flagon, where the focus rays of the sun converged. The moth circled, flew past it, almost brushing it with his wings... We waited. He circled again. Again. Then dove at it. Well, Todd. Yes. Leon. I apologize. <laughs> Tiny moth triggered the reaction that disintegrated, that crystallized that bottle into a million tiny grains like sand. And simply because of the difference in temperature of his little body. Seems impossible, but it happened. Expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford, $204 even. Remarks? Pay up this claim in a hurry, will you? The more help we can give to people like Dr. Alworth and Leon Salkoff, the better. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week? Well, I thought my job in Florida was all done. Far from it. It had just begun. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob.
Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Vic Perrin, Herb Ellis, Paul Richards, Lou Merrill, and Leon Velasco. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.